Imperialism for inviting me to join you today. It's an honor to be here with you. Um, we have always known uh, throughout the years and have always seen your involvement in the struggle for Palestinian liberation and Palestinian rights as an ongoing and consistent part of your work and activity. And so um, we're very glad to join you today. And of course, it's an honor to be here with Sirat as well and um, with the Irish comrades who are struggling for liberation um, and who are fighting for the freedom of political prisoners because there's a very long history of joint struggle between um, the Irish movement and the Palestinian struggle specifically in relation to political prisoners. Now, of course, as we know, um, while right now Palestine is under Zionist colonization, Palestine was under British colonization from 1917 until 1948. And it was in fact British colonialism in Palestine under the so-called mandate period, which supported and facilitated the um, which supported and facilitated the process of arming and supplying Zionists with weaponry to attack Palestinians. Um, Palestinians time and time again have risen in uprisings. Palestinians have called themselves the people of Intifada as the people of uprisings because they have refused to uh, they've refused to to concede to colonialism just like the Irish people um, over the course of centuries and in the past 100 years we've seen Palestinians rise up time and time again in 1922 and 1929 and 1936 um, and those first revolts, those revolutions of the 20th century were all against fighting against British colonialism and fighting against the British policy of um, extracting, uh, of, of brutally uh, repressing Palestinian struggles and of brutally repressing Palestinian rights. Now, of course, the infamous Balfour Declaration, it says everything about how the British, about how British imperialism viewed Palestine, that is, you know, as entirely its property to be dispensed with as it chose um, without any regards to the positions, uh, perspectives, feelings, needs, or rights of the indigenous people of that land. And so it was it was um, viewed as both as a mechanism by you know, anti-Semitic European imperialists of ridding themselves of their Jewish population while at the same time forming an alliance with the right-wing force of Zionism to engage in a colonial project inside occupied Palestine, which the Zionist movement stated again and again that it fully intended to be a bulwark for the West, a bulwark for imperialism within, um, within the Arab world, within the region. I mean, this is why we see Herzl approaching Cecil Rhodes to say that this is a colonial project and we have common interests to discuss together. And I think the Balfour Declaration and the ensuing events make it perfectly clear that there were in fact very common interests between Zionism and British imperialism and those common interests have continued um, to dominate the situation until the present day. In 1936, um, in what was one of the greatest revolts in Palestinian history, including a general strike, which lasted for over six months, um, when we talk about Izzedin al-Qassam and where this name in Palestinian history comes from. I mean, Izzedin al-Qassam was actually Syrian, but he was in Pal he was in Palestine and he was one of the leaders of the resistance and he was one of the leaders of the popular resistance, um, not the resistance that wanted to negotiate and seek a compromise with the British who believed that the British could be kind of like won over to support some minor rights for Palestinians that could at least benefit um, Palestinian feudalists if no one else. Um, Izzedin al-Qassam, while we often hear the name today in the context of Hamas's armed, uh, armed wing, Izzedin al-Qassam was not just a sheikh and not just a religious leader. He was a popular leader who fought among the peasantry and among the workers who organized in the villages and in the land of Palestine to defend the Palestinian people and fight back against uh, and fight back against British colonialism inside Palestine. And in that, in the course of suppressing the 1936 through 1939 revolution in Palestine, uh, not only did the British supply massive, massive supplies of arms to Zionist forces um, to arm them in preparation for the Nakba to come, but also um, we see many of the same techniques that are currently used by the Israeli occupation in Palestine against the Palestinian movement 
movement. So British forces blowing up Palestinians' houses to punish them for participating in revolts. That same kind of collective punishment that we see today when Palestinian homes are destroyed by the Israeli occupation, when Palestinian prisoners are seized by occupation forces and accused of taking part in the resistance and their family home is destroyed. Well, this is something that the British used to do as well. Even administrative detention, imprisonment without charge or trial inside occupied Palestine was initially a British colonial uh, regulation implemented during the mandate. It was one of the British emergency regulations. And of course it remains in place today and is used systematically by the Zionist state to imprison and lock away Palestinian leaders, community organizers, student organizers, women's organizers, labor activists, um, to, to grab them from their community and lock them up for up to six months at a time um, in a process that's indefinitely renewable without charge and without trial. And this is a process uh, and, a, and a type of imprisonment that has often been compared to the experience of internment in the occupied north of Ireland as well. And um, so we see these same kinds of ongoing British colonial legacies, which continue to be reflected in British policy towards Palestine that is unmitigated support for Zionist colonialism and the, and the Israeli state and the destruction and deprivation of Palestinian rights and an unmitigated attack, uh, not only on Palestinian organizations and Palestinian organizers, but of anybody within Britain or within Scotland or within Ireland um, or within Wales who wants to fight back and stand with the Palestinian people. And so we saw this, you know, um, this complete and utter sham, the labeling of anti-racism and international solidarity as anti-Semitism, when of course it is really the political descendants of Balfour who reflect the legacy of British anti-Semitism, those who equate Jewishness with the horrific crimes of Zionism and occupation and colonialism that reflect a truly anti-Semitic approach and, and not um, and not the Palestinian movement and certainly not the left. So today as we're gathering, I think it's uh, just to the picture behind me is of the is of the Progressive Democratic Student Poll, which is a student organization at Birzeit University inside occupied Palestine. And Palestinian students have come under sustained and intense attack. Um, and, and this attack has only escalated in recent years. Um, there are currently around 300 Palestinian university students in Israeli jails out of approximately 5,000 Palestinian political prisoners overall. Um, of those around uh, 70 of those students are from Birzeit University. And the progressive democratic student and the Palestinian student movement has always been a very important part of the Palestinian struggle for liberation, including the student movement inside occupied Palestine and the student movement of Palestinians in exile and diaspora, um, organizing to fight for the liberation of Palestine and for their return to Palestine. So the, um, the progressive and Palestinian student politics are often seen as kind of a barometer for what's happening in Palestinian politics overall because Palestinian students have worked and fought very hard to create this environment of democratic political engagement and competition on their campuses with an eye towards, you know, how do we resist occupation? And so we see the Islamic bloc or the Yasser Arafat bloc or the progressive democratic student poll, which is left student bloc, um, contesting every year in student elections. And when this happens, um, what we also see is, of course, you know, Israeli occupation soldiers wearing, um, dressing themselves up as Palestinians and invading the campus and, and attacking students. We see Israeli military vehicles storming onto campuses, invading student offices, and we see students being arrested in mass. And so this kind of takes place every year. What happened just just today, just this morning, is that the Progressive Democratic Student Poll was officially listed um, by the Israeli occupation by the commander of the military forces in the occupied West Bank as a prohibited terrorist organization. Now, this is a very common charge. Every Palestinian political party is listed in this way. Um, essentially, any Palestinian organization that it, opposes Zionism and that stands against colonialism is listed as a prohibited organization. But traditionally, students are charged with 
support for or affiliation with a prohibited organization based on the political party or political ideology which their student bloc supports. So if you're arrested for being a member of the Progressive Democratic Student Poll, they'll accuse you of that, you know, your work is supporting or um, is affiliated with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. If you're arrested and you're you are engaged with the Islamic bloc, they'll you know argue that you're what you're doing is providing support to Hamas through your engagement in the sort in the student bloc. So by directly listing the student bloc, they're really escalating the criminalization and repression targeting Palestinian students, and it's also an attempt to kind of stop the connections that are being formed between Palestinian students in 1948 occupied Palestine within Israel and Palestinian students inside um, in Birzeit and throughout the occupied West Bank and throughout Gaza by saying, oh, now if you are engaged in contact with these students, if you're participating even in an online meeting, well, you're engaging with a prohibited terrorist organization. Now there are um, the several of the students that are members of the progressive student bloc who are currently in prison sent a message uh, saluting their comrades and calling everyone to stand in solidarity. This is an important thing that's happening and it really underlines why it's so critically important to build international solidarity, particularly among students with Palestinians who are under attack. And also as we're meeting today, this is um, the 85th day of Maher al Akras's hunger strike. He's um, held, he's a Palestinian man from Janine, father of six children, who is jailed without charge or trial by the Israeli occupation. He has repeatedly been jailed without charge or trial by the Israeli occupation. He launched his hunger strike as soon as the administrative detention order was imposed upon him. Now, of course, the alternative to administrative detention is not justice either. It's the Israeli military courts, which imprison 99.74% of the Palestinians brought before them. Um, but Maher has rejected all of the attempts at compromise, and he has spoken up loudly and clearly from his hospital bed, even when he can barely speak, when he um, is barely capable of sustaining his life, to say that this is a choice between freedom or death, and he's going to choose freedom. Um, so this legacy of hunger strikes, which come, which has a very deep and rich history in both the Irish and Palestinian movements, has always been something that brought together these movements and built solidarity. So we see in 1981, Palestinian prisoners and their families um, protesting and issuing statements and expressing solidarity with Irish hunger strikers in, in the H block and, and saying that our struggle is yours and we're committed together in the struggle against Zionism, British colonialism and imperialism. And then in 2017, we see Irish Republican prisoners um, issuing statements and expressing solidarity and even refusing meals from time to time in solidarity with Palestinian prisoners on the Karama or Dignity hunger strike. So this connection is one that has continued throughout the years of Irish and Palestinian joint struggle within the prisons and of, in many cases, the leadership of these movements being locked behind bars in an attempt by British and Zionist colonialism to deprive the movement and deprive the community of its leading organizers and of those who are working to achieve freedom. So today, when we look at the case of the Sirad Nine and Issam Hijawi, this is a critical case for all of us around the world who care about freedom and justice and liberation for the people of Ireland, for the people of Palestine, for all forces around the world that are fighting against colonialism and imperialism. Um, Issam, of course, is a Palestinian leader. I mean, we, this has been said many times. And he has always been active throughout Europe in participating in conferences and events to help mobilize collective support for the Palestinian cause. And it's not surprising in many ways that Issam was targeted by British intelligence along with Sirad. Because one thing that has, one of the ways in which imperialism has attacked the Palestinian movement is by equating Palestinianness and Palestinian identity as kind of 
the uh, the the paradigmatic example of terrorism. And so when we see attempts to criminalize movements and organizations, or even organizations and movements that have already faced intense, intense criminalization for decades and centuries and decades of repression, um, what we see is this attempt to present the link to Palestinians as kind of this uh, ultimate threat to imperialism. So just as we say that the Palestinian struggle is a symbol of anti-imperialism and that everywhere we see the Palestinian flag, this is a place where people are fighting for justice. Well, our enemies see it the same way. And so it's not surprising that they chose to target Islam and to engage in this ridiculous and, and appalling and really, I mean, just disgusting entrapment scheme designed to cr collectively criminalize Irish and Palestinian struggle and lock up its advocates behind bars and really to frighten and suppress people from making these connections. This is not just an attack on the Sirad 9 and Assam Hujawi as individuals. It's an attempt to crack down on solidarity between movements, on joint struggle, and on collective anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist solidarity and action. And so that is why it's so important to not leave Assam and his comrades alone behind bars. And you know, as we're speaking today also, this is the International Week of Action for George Abdullah. He's a Lebanese Arab communist and a struggler for, for Palestine who's been locked up in French jails for 36 years as of this, as of this Saturday, as of October 24th. And George, there's a growing movement for the liberation of George Abdullah, but the imprisonment of George Abdullah in France is very much also um, not just an attack on one person. It's the attack of French colonialism on the Palestinian liberation movement and also on Lebanon, its former colonies, on Arab movements, on liberation movements. And George, just like the Irish prisoners, has always been someone who stands specifically with the Irish struggle and with political prisoners everywhere who are struggling for justice and freedom and liberation. And it reminds us that when we look at the United States and we see the Holy Land Five locked behind bars, when we look at France and we see George Abdullah locked behind bars, when we look at the British state and we see the Sierra Nine and their and their fellow Irish Republican comrades locked behind bars and Assam Hijawi with them, that we can see that all of these imperialist forces and their prison systems are part and parcel of the same system that we are fighting to bring to an end in Palestine. And in order for us to build that struggle and to collectively strengthen and support the movement of Palestine in order to free political prisoners from Ireland to Palestine to the Philippines to the United States um, in order to free the black liberation prisoners that have been locked behind bars in the US for over 40 years. We need to build our collective struggle and our international solidarity and put the prisoners where they belong front and center in the struggle as they continue to lead us and inspire us to move forward. Thank you again for inviting me to join you today. Uh Thanks very much to Charlotte, and again, thanks again to all three of our speakers, uh, uh, Ruby, Jude, and, and Charlotte, for their fantastic uh, contributions. Um, 